Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Designer Dave. Today we're going to talk about the state of the game industry with all the layoffs and stuff. I'm sure a lot of you have been wondering what's going on with the layoffs. I myself in my LinkedIn feed every day, I'm seeing more and more people looking for jobs, uh, not knowing what to do, wondering <laughs> if anyone can help them find a job. Unfortunately, right now, there's not a lot of jobs to be had. So uh, it's a very difficult time for a lot of game developers. But <clears throat> this isn't unusual. It, it is slightly unusual, but it, there's a cyclical nature to the game industry. And the way that it works is um, the third and fourth, fourth financial quarter. Okay, so most of these are huge corporations now, right? So in the third and fourth financial quarter, these companies want to show a, a profit. And what's the fastest way to profit? To show a larger profit margin? Fire some employees. You don't have to pay their salaries for the rest of the year and, and you get a bunch of, of breaks. And you don't have to pay for their health insurance and all that other stuff that goes with being an American corporation. This is mostly for America, by the way. This, this is not the same as in like uh, Europe and, and other places where you guys have universal health care and other really good things that America needs but will never get. So it, it really is about corporate greed uh, and making their financials look good uh, towards the final fiscal quarter, the third and fourth quarter, which is why you see a lot of layoffs just ahead of the holidays because the holidays are non-productive months where most people are just on vacation or you have to let everyone go, you know, it's like two weeks off for Christmas, at least one week, uh, depending on the company, uh, where those people aren't working at all. So why keep them around? Just fire them, right? If money's the bottom line. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of them think. Uh, they don't consider the aspect of the demoralization of losing coworkers and those people then being uh, out of a job. And then when you need to, to find new employees, which is, this is the cycle, uh, now in the first quarter and the second quarter of the next year, all these companies that did all these firings and layoffs, they're going to go, oh no, we're way behind on production now. We're not going to make the release date for the game. <laughs> so then they have to do a bunch of hiring, right? But you can't hire back the people you just uh, let go. So what do you do? <laughs> you have to hire newbies and you can pay them less or you hire pros uh, who haven't worked at your company yet, but they're going to come into it with their eyes wide open going, oh, I know these guys are freaking mercenaries. So I'm going to be waiting for my opportunity to get more money out of them. <laughs> so you either pay a lot more than you would have, or you pay a lot less for much lower quality work because you're getting noobs. So it's kind of the, the cycle that they've created, these corporations, is they lay off employees to make their fiscal quarter look good, and then they have to hire a bunch of new people, and they're just churning through all these people in the industry. And once you've been let go from a company like that, you generally don't ever want to work there again. And also, you might even be on a list where it's like, oh, we've already had them here, so never hire them again. And how that list works depends on the company, but a lot of them have that effectively a blacklist for anyone who used to work for them. <clears throat> that, that's, the, that's where they overreach. They think that, uh, oh, we know what we're doing. We'll just, just hire the next crop of new people next year. That's when things start to fall apart because all of that uh, company knowledge that went with all the former employees are now gone. And so those new people come in, they have to learn the company culture and all that kind of stuff that we've talked about in the past or they don't, or no one talks to them at all and they're just expected to do the job, who knows what's gonna happen? Like, that's why development, especially at these larger corporations, has become chaotic and destructive. What often comes out of it is there's a bunch of potential startups that, that happen because now there's all these very experienced people out there. Um, some of them are able to fund themselves for some period of time and they start looking for the possibility of opening their own studio or getting together with a couple of their friends who they had a couple ideas that they thought might make a good game. And then you see these startups happen. And I've seen a lot of startups happen after a, a, a layoff cycle. That's also where a lot of indie developers come out of the picture now because now it's like there's a million different engines that you can choose to make a game in. And a lot of people... Uh, 
just decide, hey, I'll just make my own game. I don't need I don't need anyone else, or I'll just hire people for art when I need that, uh, and things like that. Or they just use you know <laughs> whatever they can find off of the uh, the stores because you can just get a bunch of art that way. Um, but either way, they start making their own little prototypes and games, and uh, we see a bunch of indies come out of nowhere. And I think that's what we're going to see. Uh, well, we've seen the layoffs. The layoffs have happened. The blame, the, the reason that this cycle was particularly bad was because we had a big boom in the in game sales and revenue and everything from the, the uh, viral contaminant that uh, d definitely wasn't constructed in a lab. And because of that, we had <laughs> a huge boom cycle for games, lots of increased revenue, and so all the big megacorps go, oh, this will go on forever. So they hire a bunch of extra staff. And then when that ended and people started going outside again and like, oh, wow, there's a sun. Uh, all of a sudden they lost a bunch of revenue <clears throat> and they're like, oh, this is unsustainable now. So we better fire all these people. <clears throat> and that's why we've seen so much more layoffs this cycle than we typically do in, in the past few. Um, but it's not the first time I've seen like a, a bust cycle like this. The last one was 2008, um, which was ironic because it actually ended up being quite good for the game industry because everyone was stuck home with nothing to do, so they played games. The, the big shining light in all this, for me anyways, has been Baldur's Gate 3, which is a return to form for what things used to be. And maybe a lot of you, my viewers are younger, so they don't remember. But like 14 years ago, there was like Dragon Age Origins and there was a bunch of really high-end RPGs. And before that, like 10 years before that, there was a bunch of the gold box games and things like that, which were huge RPGs. And it's that return to quality that I think will force the hand of the, the AAA industry. Because right now they're all like whining and complaining oh, no one can do Baldur's Gate 3. It's something only Larian can do because of special super circumstances. Nah. But that's not true. All it takes is for you to hire developers and let them work on something they love. And I did a whole video on that, on, on Baldur's Gate 3 and Games as a Service. And uh, I suggest you watch that if you haven't already. But the point is that the cat's out of the bag. Like, it can be done. Larian did it. They did it with less people than EA has. They did it with less people than Activision Blizzard has. They did it with a lot, a lot less people than Microsoft has. It's vi totally viable strategy, but it requires them to hire people who love what they're going to be working on and to let them work on it the way that they want, um, which that's a tall order at these megacorps now because they don't even, I don't know that they even like what they're doing themselves. Like, I don't, <laughs> does, does Starfield seem like a labor of love to anyone? It doesn't to me. <laughs> Now I'm going to get some shit for that. Uh, anyways, so let me give you a short list of how do we force corporate hands to go back to this old school model of AAA development where you make a labor of love and then you release it when it's really good. Um, number one, don't pre-order. Never, ever pre-order. Um, you're blind buying something. You have no idea what it's going to be when it releases. So you're just handing them money for nothing. Don't do that. Do early access. Yes, if you like what you see in uh, in there, they go into early access, and you're like, yeah, this is the type of game that I would like to play. Buy in. That's a great time to buy in because then you get to experience the development. You get to contribute your voice to that development, and they can refine the game and make sure that when it does release, it'll be an even better experience than it could have been. And there is no better proof than that uh, working than Baldur's Gate Three which got a lot of feedback over two years of their early access. And uh, I think it was much a much better game for it. <clears throat> Number two, stop auto buying games that don't meet your standards. I know that it's tempting like, oh, it's the latest from Bethesda. I have to, you know, play it just to keep up. I regret buying Starfield. I'm just going to say it because I'm, I know I'm not going to play it ever again. I played it for, I think, four hours and was so utterly bored that I started looking up other people playing it to see what they were experiencing, and it was the same. It was the same problems that I had. It was the same. It's the same problems Bethesda has always had with all of their games, going back to time immemorial, 
problems with the inventory, how it works and stuff. But now with added, with all the loading screens and everything like that, how does it, <laughs> how does this game have more loading screens than Skyrim? Anyways, uh, so just don't auto buy a game just because it's the latest in the series. Like I want you to wait and see what they do with the next Elder Scrolls. And if you wait for it to come out, don't pre-order. And when the reviews start coming in, pay attention to what they're saying. And um, not necessarily the big corporate ones, like maybe Second Wind, like <laughs> look at their reviews and stuff and see if it's actually something you want to play. Don't just auto buy. And then let's say you do buy these games um, and you don't, you're kind of disappointed with it. Go ahead and make reviews and state logically in your review exactly why you're disappointed in this game and what you would like to see from them. In the case of Starfield, I wanted to see a lot, I wanted to see a way better interface. The user interface is atrocious. Uh, I wanted to see um, more dynamic quests. I wanted to see better performances, voice acting and uh, physical performances. I thought those could have be way better than they were. It's always been flat deliveries with these guys. And it was a step back from Fallout, uh, the last Fallout, in my opinion. I thought they had better performances. So make your case because if they if you all state the same things logically they have to listen at some point or go out of business especially if you follow the first two steps but whatever you do don't attack the devs the devs it's not their fault it's not the devs fault these are corporate decisions remember with like mass effect andromeda the devs were the ones warning them hey we can't release the, the facial animation system is not working the way that it's supposed to let's fix it by hand you know if we have to they didn't listen i'm sure that there were some whistleblowers at bethesda too going you know starfield's not exactly what we've promised let's hold it back and then they were told no by their corporate masters all right last one make an extra effort to support indies and actually start digging for games that might be exactly what you're looking for you might be surprised what you find out there um, there are a lot of little indie darling children uh, that don't necessarily haven't necessarily found their audience yet. <clears throat> but if you go on like you know the .io and the uh, crap, I forgot the other one. There's a number of places. I'll, I'll I'll post some links in the description for places to go to look for indie games. But you might be surprised. There might be exactly what you're looking for. You're like, I wish I had this type of game. I wish someone would make this type of game. I bet you it exists at this point because every year I'm looking at the number of release titles and every year that number goes up. So like there were over 5,000 games released in 2023 already. Have you seen 5,000 games? Have you even seen a hundred? Yeah. So they're out there somewhere. I mean, I'm sure a lot of them are trash or garbage <laughs> or someone's first outing and they weren't sure what they were doing, but Look and ye shall find. And uh, it's the discovery is difficult, but it can be very rewarding and you can find exactly what you're looking for. So uh, I hope that helps explain what's been going on with the uh, <laughs> game industry's layoff issues recently. Um, if you are a patron uh, or you're interested in becoming one to support more content like this, let me know. Uh, so far, only one person has whitelisted me, uh, listing their name, Abel Hawk. I'm calling you out directly. Thank you for being one of my patrons. Uh, to everyone else, uh, feel free to join me on Discord and have these discussions with me uh, live. And if I don't see you later, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.